before, and you will be writing many more reports. And uh, the reason why we added this lecture is that even though you have been writing and will be writing other reports, there are always questions. How are we supposed to write this report? And, uh, and we also see that uh, even after writing many reports, there are still some lack of and maturity in writing reports. That's why we try to do this. And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of content on the slides. Uh, so I don't think you're going to remember everything now, but hopefully you can use the slide set as a reference point, and when you're going to write the report, just go through them and, and re recap. Um, so, <laughs> uh, one of our colleague professors, he wrote the initial, long time back, uh, initial uh, presentation of how to write reports, and uh, based on mine, <laughs> and I'm basically yeah. this so the he said yeah, when it comes to the, the first part, the structure and content of reports. Uh, then we talked a little bit about the writing styles, and we talked specifically about this report. So the first part is going to be general, because if you understand the general, it's easier to answer questions about this specific report too. Type of report. So, uh, but we'll look at it uh, in the end, look at the specific uh, uh, report. And reflection for learning, that sounds like a, like a project uh, in this uh, applied computer science project. All right. So, it's always good to start by thinking about the purpose. Why are we writing a technical report? And uh, it is somehow to report the outcome of something we did, a project, or it could be a research project, it could be a development project, it could be um, uh, some technical work, typically. And it has an audience. So now comes the question, what is the audience in, in your case? Yeah, who, who do you, yeah, you write for me? Yeah, you write for the examiners. Anyone else? For the courses, basically. Yeah. The, the main audience is for the course, but the, this is technical work. So it might be that someone would like to continue. I mean, uh, the guide, someone may want to continue to develop into a full fledged project or the uh, learning reflection diary. It's, it's a first prototype, yes, it's a prototype, and the main pr purpose is on the process and the tools, but doesn't mean that it's not interesting to document the actual product, because there may be an interest in the product. Some group may decide to, or, or um, next year, Marius or I may decide to have a bachelor project on this, and then we will like to use the report, say, hey, this is what these guys studied and what they came up with. So it is the audience may be more than just the examiners, but of course the examiners will be the prime audience at Lulu. So then what do you want to, to address? What should the report answer? It needs to answer what is the motivation for the work. And the motivation is not your motivation. This is sometimes a mis, uh, misunderstanding. So when we ask about the motivation, oh, I really like this, or I really like this course. No, it's not about your motivation. It's about the society's motivation. Why would a reflection diary be helpful? Why, what can a glide type of tool do? What is the problem? Who, is, who are the stakeholders? That, that's kind of what we want to do the report. What are relevant related reports? May not be so much in this course, because the focus here is on um, uh, the process and the tools for developing, not the challenge of the product or on the, of the system. So in your case, it may not be so many, but still, if you use a methodology that is, uh, uh, that is different from the standard sets here, if you use an API, if you use some tools, if you use some technologies, include references so that the reader can understand what is your starting point. And then, of course, it's about activities. What is where and why? But it's not 
it has to be prioritized. And it's not like you would like to present this. I'm going to come back to that. It's not like you're going to present this as you were on this uh, day to day uh, holiday trip. What I did day one, and I started with breakfast, and I went to the swimming pool. And that's not the type of story. So it's more what are the important activities? And sequence of activities is, in many cases, not so important. Sometimes it is, sequence of actions, but in many cases it's not. It is actually the actions. Why they were taken, and uh, what they were, and, uh, and then how was it worked out. So you need to spell out how we worked. In your case, how we used the tools, how we worked together, how we organized activities. What did you achieve, in both in terms of product and in terms of process experience? Because in, our, in this case, the achievements will typically be both some tangible artifact and it will be some knowledge, some new or strengthened knowledge. So you need to remember to include what you learn, not just what you built. And that applies to most projects. You would like to summarize the technical work, the piece of, uh, of system that you develop, but also what skills, what, uh, what knowledge you, uh, you develop as well. And then the conclusions. What conclusion can you draw? And the conclusions need to be built on this, and the achievements need to be built on the documentation of activities and uh, tasks. It's not a narrative. It's not uh, what's the, uh, in some communities are called the Marco Polo paper. Marco Polo, you know, we travel around. So it says what what he did the first day and the seventh day, and when he and, uh, ended up on an island, what he did then. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. It's not a narrative in that sense. It is trying to focus on the important tasks, what they were, what the results were. This is. The general structure. Uh, it, it's uh, often called IMRAD because introduction, methodology, results, and discussion. IMRAD. You have, you have heard about it before? IMRAD? Some of you have. It's, it's a typical, you have an introduction, and then you can say introduction would include the background. You have the methods, you have the results, and the discussion. I would think that IMRAD, the abbreviation, uh, should have included the C because the most important thing is the conclusion, I would say. So IMRAD doesn't say that you should conclude, but, but anyway, the conclusion has to be Very often we like to see a, an hourglass model. What do we mean by hourglass model? It means that the introduction starts quite wide. We try to set the stage by looking at, uh, for instance, uh, the challenge in reflection in uh, learning, or the, the challenge for finding where uh, parachuting is happening and what are the um, important or interesting characteristics in the various areas. So we start by, but typically we have limited resources. So what we can do is much narrower. So we start by, and then we narrow in. I say, this is what we want to do. And then the, this is where we design the methodologies and we get the results. But when we discuss the results, we would like to make as big impact as possible. And with making impact, we, we're trying to generalize. We're trying to reflect on our results in a wider context. So we start wide and we end out wide. Because we, we, we think we learn more than just these smaller parts. There is some general knowledge that uh, others can use. It can be used in other contexts. So that's what we try to. So in, in your case, for instance, we would like to, to test some methods, some results in this project. But you would like to bring experience for different kinds of project work, maybe using other methods in your case. So think of it. We want to like to set the stage. You don't start the introduction by saying uh, something, uh, jumping right, right into uh, the support for uh, learning or right into the format of a glide file. You start by, by setting the stage. And when you conclude, you end up being more broader and more generic than, than really the, the, the more narrow study that you're doing. 
Now, interesting. How do you how do you write uh, read? I mean, how do you read a paper? You you probably found some research papers already uh, in this course or in the scientific work or some other uh, other uh, scientific yeah, scientific methodology course. How do you go forward if you find a piece of research paper? Where do you start? Do you start from the introduction? Abstract. Title and abstract, yes. And then after abstract? Skip the section that I want reference. Yeah, maybe you just go to the conclusion, see what they conclude. Yeah. And then, if you're interested, you look to the, the parts that you find interesting. And then, okay, if it, that sounds good, then you may read all of it. But you don't start from the beginning. This also tells a little bit what is more and not is not so in, important when you write because you will like the you will like to meet the readers. When the readers li read your your report this way. I mean, uh, the examiners will obviously read your whole report. <laughs> so uh, from a from a to Z, but but still, still it's easier to uh, even as an examiner, it's easier. To mark and and read your report, if you start by reading the conclusion, then you know okay where are these guys heading, and then you try to see is the report supporting the conclusion. So so don't assume that uh, the the report is necessarily going to be re read from start to end. Uh, the title it should be as specific as possible. So, but you don't have to uh, try to add all the hype words you find. I mean, there, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, for some time it's been that if you choose three hype words, put them together, then you have a, a research paper title. So you don't have to, but try to be specific. Because you would like to attract the readers that would be really interested in what you've done, and you don't want to, uh, what should I say, um, uh, Disappoint readers because if you if you write a, a misleading title, you disappoint readers, and if they get disappointed a couple of times, they will stop reading what you write. Uh, so it, it should try to condense the most important message to the paper, and uh, should ascertain that the paper is found in searcher searches. So it should include typical terms that you, you think yourself if you were interested in in. This area and this problem, you will, will, what would be your keywords? And try to see if you can put some of these keywords up in the title. And, and also, the, of course, the most important thing is that it catches the attention of the relevant audience. Uh, and the title is the part that will be read the most because many would only read the title of your, of your report. Many readers will just do that. So this is the most read part. So that's that's why it's so important that it is, it is good. But don't forget. I mean, even in even in uh, reports that you're supposed to do the hand in here in this course, integration project, advanced project work, it should have a title, not just a report is coming with introduction. It should have a title and should list the author. It should list the affiliation. In our case, it should be what is the course in which this is a report and the date. Because I keep, uh, I'm a database person, so I don't delete anything. So I keep everything. So I keep all reports the students have submitted. And uh, it would be good for me when I'm looking for a one report. I remember a group did something. So I can find the year or the date that was published. I can find the course. And I can find who the authors were and the title. So just make sure that all of this is included in the paper. It's so easy to, it seems to be so easy to forget because uh, every year I do get reports without the title, without the authors listed, without dates. It's easy to just include. Now the abstract. In the PDF that I uploaded uh, to Confluence, you'll find a link to a very short paper. Written in '66, a scrutiny of the abstract. The paper is is very short. It has. It, it starts by having a, a bad abstract. Then it has a very short paper about writing abstracts, 
And then they have a the conclusion, a good abstract. It's nice. Uh, so this is what they say is a bad abstract. Why is this a bad abstract? It doesn't actually say anything. It doesn't say anything. <laughs> and you would be surprised how many of these abstracts are around. That's the majority, even in research papers. The students say, oh, we have this great problem that we looked at. <laughs> OK. What did they learn? It says nothing. It says nothing. But the conclusion and revised abstracts present it doesn't say what that contains. <laughs> it reveals nothing. And there, they rewrote it. This is their good abstract. After the short paper, this is what they what they did. So here they are quite they are quite exact, saying okay, they look at numbers between. Hundred and about ten and five hundred times more, and they say that it should not be. So they're quite specific on what is a bad abstract, and then they must be able to describe what's a good one. And uh, I think that if you can remember that condensation and concentration. So if you say if you look, by the end of the, of, of the project, you say what is the most important contribution? What is the most important results? What do we learn that's most important? And you try to write this up. Of course, you typically, so typically the abstract will be kind of two paragraphs or at least two parts because you need a little bit, even in the abstract, you need a little bit of setting the stage. So you need a little bit of general introduction. What is the problem? And then the rest should be what is our major contribution, results, what you will learn. That is the, and, and that means that you have to eliminate quite a lot of details because you have to focus on the most important part. And there was another one a bit later, writing a scrutiny of the introduction. <laughs> so this was a short paper discussing the introduction. And, and if you remember the hourglass model, we start out wide and it will like narrow down to what we actually did. That. And they do, uh, uh, or third part, he does this in three steps. He says you start with a review, and then you make a claim, and then you outline your agenda. What does that mean? The review is that short summary of the background, previous work, why is this an interesting problem, uh, and you may even have some relevant papers. Uh, in, in the Glide case, it may be referring to a, to a database or to a system where you have all these paths to the learning uh, diary. You may have some reference to others who have done some reflection or e either a reflection theory or some, some other tools for reflection support. Uh, and I try to summarize what is currently the state currently, where are we at? And then it should lead up to the claim. Because the claim is that there is something missing. The claim is the most important part. It is saying why is what we're doing so important? What is currently missing? What is what do we why why are we doing this? Uh, and here you, you may use personal pronouns. I don't like I in your case it won't be an I because you got three you, you have the, the four or five uh, authors. So if one of you write I, it's it's kind of look kind of strange in a group report. <laughs> So if, but even if you are the single author, it's it's quite common to use we rather than I, uh, uh, because it's it's not so much about the individual author as much as this uh, research contribution. It should be a consequence of the review. So this review is a this is current to the state. Here's something missing that we will have to look at, and that's important because, and that leads up then to the agenda, which is saying, okay, what are we going to do about it? What is our project? And it's a short summary of the contents of the report. You've probably read uh, these, um, these reports that's, uh, that you have at the end of the introduction say, so in chapter two, we're going to do this. In section three, we're going to do this. In section four, we're going to do this. In section five, we're going to do this. That's kind of what we like to see in the agenda. 
but this is boring and it looks like a table of content and you can rather go to the table of content to look at it. So what we try to do, the best place here is to try to write it in a, in a text that you try to reason why you go through this, saying, okay, we'll look at the method, uh, uh, first we're going to review the methodology and we're going to go on and go on that. But write that as a text that you can kind of read the user. It's not just a, a, a short version of the table of contents. But you should help the user understand how you design the reports or how they what they can expect when they read the rest of the report. So, typically in the review, the first part, you say somebody did something or this is the state of something, uh, but currently no one is looking into or currently there is no tool or currently we can't. And then, thus, in our work, we did design something, we did test something, we did, and then you describe or how you went forward. Then in the background chapter, background chapter is not going to be so big in your case, because in this project there isn't a lot of the background. You, you do, I mean, you need to have a little bit about what others have been doing, but it's not the major part. But in, in some of the later projects, advanced project work, for instance, you are supposed to read up quite a lot on the research literature, and then the background chapter is going to be more. It's going to summarize previous research. This is also called the state of the art. You're trying to say, okay, what is the current practice? What is the current state of the uh, of this field? And it should be, in normal cases, it should be the part of the report that has most references, because that's what they do. You reference what others have done. That's the background. What have others been doing here? Uh, so there is a you there is a, you can go in the in the, in one of the um, um, one of the errors you can make here is that you can write this into kind of a textbook. It's not going to happen in this project, but when you do advanced project work or some of the other courses, you may be tempted to write up a textbook and trying to to document and refer to everything, every single equation that you've seen. You're going to find a reference for it, but that's going to be. Too much, and it's not going to be relevant because what you like to do is that you like to include what is important and what is not common knowledge. So, uh, and how can we know what common knowledge is? I think if you go back to the um, if you go back to the audience, who will be the audience? If you think about the audience, because if you can assume that the audience knows this from before, you don't have to repeat it. In this case, the audience will be then the examiners. And it will be other students or, or other projects that uh, would want to continue what we're doing. And then we can assume that whatever you have had in school up to now is probably rather common knowledge. So what you need to refer to would be what would be specific about learning diaries, what would be specific about uh, about uh, glide um, and, and parachute paths and, and whatever. So when you, uh, I mean, it, it may make sense, obviously, to refer to Agile, but you don't necessarily need to have Agile references because you can expect that Agile for all methodologies will be useful. But if you use something specific about Agile, then you may need to include the co-author and reference that because may not everybody know Agile. You can assume that they read the notes Agile, but not necessarily the specifics. So if you talk about something very special, you may need to include a reference to it. So it, it's not a very exact science, but, but uh, I think it's helpful to think about the audience. Who would the reader be? Is this something that you can assume that the readers would know that you don't need references? If you say this is something that might be very new to readers, then we would include it. Don't make it, not, don't bloat it up. Don't include lots of references that you aren't using. And using means that you don't say what they, just say what they do, but it, you say, okay, so what does that mean for my project? Because it's related work, meaning that it will have an impact on your project. You have, would have done your project differently if that hadn't been done before. That's kind of the idea here. It needs to have a clear impact. Uh, and this is not where you say what you do, or what you what you have it. This is where you say, before we started, what's, what did the world look like before we started? 
and then your contributions come later. Questions about this part? In the, when you get into a more scientific paper, there is also a question whether background and related work, whether you should have one more on theories and more and more work on research, some general theories, and, and that's that depends uh, what was like accomplished. Uh, can you cite your earlier work? You can obviously cite your earlier work. So you should. That's part, and you should, yes, absolutely. If you build on something you've done before, you should definitely put it in here, because this is part of the community knowledge you can, uh, and that it's yours, that, that's fine. Yeah. So, because this, what comes after is what you do in this project, not what you've done in the earlier project. That should definitely be in the background, absolutely. Actually, you should Yes. Yeah, it, that's. Uh, I mean, the, that that's. Um, um, yeah, to, because otherwise it may look like you are trying to um, improve your current work based on what you did before. But what you did before is already been. You already had been graded, you already made some contributions that, that you've been uh, acknowledged for. So you don't want to put it in here as this is something new. If you don't say, it's assumed that this is something you discovered in this course, and you will get your pay, but if you did it before, you shouldn't have paid. And that, that, that's why, yes, absolutely, it is important. Yeah. Uh, when you're done with the background, then you don't have to... Uh, uh, you don't have to, uh, what to say, repeat any of the discussion later on, but you may want to include a reference to so say, okay, as we discussed in the background chapter, these guys did something. That's fine to, to make it easy to read, but you don't, you don't typically rewrite uh, any of that stuff. You, you can assume that this is known, and you may include it in the reflection, but then you refer back to that uh, background chapter. Methods. Now, you need to describe your work elaborately so that everybody understands what you did and ideally they should be able to reproduce. It's not so relevant in, in, a, in a project report as it is in a research report, but in a research report it is very important that others can repeat what you do. So you need to be as, as uh, elaborate as necessary to possibly repeat, but at least be able to assess. And this is um, hopefully, or, or uh, in, in, in this case, hopefully by having the uh, reflection diary as one of the projects, we get to re repeat that in, for a reflection part, for discussion and reflection, you need a good description. You need the detail, the good description. So hopefully, uh, in today's in the demo and retrospective, when we asked about what you learned, hopefully you make notes. You're in this project, so you make notes. So when you are to write the final report, you can describe elaborately what you did, how you organized your work, what changes you made, what, why did you make these changes, how did that work, what was it better, uh, in terms of, of estimates, in terms of using the tools, in terms of, and hopefully you make notes already, so it is possible for you to el el be elaborate on what you experienced in each of the sprints, so that you can reflect on them and you can draw your conclusions. And it's important to state the reasons for the choices. So, so when we have given you feedback, uh, there has been a reason why we, why we haven't liked the burnout charts, or, or so there has been a reason. So when you discuss that you have decided to estimate this way or the other, what is, is important is to say what was the reason for that? Why did you make the change? What was the reason for it? And what were alternatives? Ideally, what were alternatives? Sometimes uh, the, the reason for your choices, sometimes you have uh, some good arguments input from uh, from the exam or from us or, or, or some other input or some experience. But sometimes you may also find uh, during the project, you may find that somebody else has done something similar to or to meet the one of the problems you've been having. And then you can make a reference saying, okay, 
we decided to go this way because these guys say that this is a good alternative as well. Results. Here's a, uh, here is a challenge. In some projects, results might be a lot of data. And you can't, you can't have uh, 40 pages of tables in a, in a report. That doesn't make sense. So results, you should have them in a condensed, aggregated way. Sometimes you may want to include all the results in an appendix. So everyone else can go and look at the actual details. Because uh, you would like to present results that you can discuss, but you don't want to have a discussion here. So first you have the raw data, and then you extract, you filter and extract data you would like to discuss. You don't discuss the raw data and filter and extract in, in one process, because then it's very hard to repeat uh, and redo what you did. So what you have the raw data, and say, okay, this is how we aggregate. We sum up on these uh, fields, or we look at this column, or we extract those who satisfy these uh, characteristics. And then you can present results that you can discuss, and you can conclude. So you need to be able to argue why you extracted data this uh, way, that the, the results you're going to be using. Figures would usually be helpful if you choose figures because they are helpful. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Sometimes um, I've seen reports where figures are added just for readability, just to make uh, the text blocks spread out a little bit and have some space in between. That's not a good, I mean, that's also a reason for having figures, but it shouldn't be the only one. So it, it should communicate not just fill up some space. Uh, you should have them as uh, floating objects, meaning that, I mean, uh, how can you um, we use uh, LaTeX? Okay, because in LaTeX that's, uh, that's quite common. I mean, the, the figures float around. Uh, those who are used to Word would sometimes try to fix the figure where exactly where I want it to be. And that may be a hard fight. <laughs> Just let it flow. Use figure numbers uh, and, and, and make use and make captions that are helpful. And then figures can float around. You can, in some cases, you may even have all the figures at the very end of the paper. I don't think that's the best from a readability point of view. But leave it to the uh, text processor, the document processor, to decide. Figure captions should, in normal cases, be below the figure. Uh, table captions tend to be above as a title. Uh, and be sure that you have the right to reprint the figure. If it's not your own, you need to ask for permission if you can reprint the, re the, the figure. Um, in our place, at least we, uh, since this is not going to be published, it may not be so hard if you include a figure from somewhere else, but at least you need to say where it came from. And you use that sort of as a reference. Um, discussion. That's, uh, that's going to lead up to the conclusion. So discussion is uh, where... So you have this problem that you started out. And now you have described the methodology, how you went forward, you have describe or include the, the major results, then you need to discuss them. So results in your case may would obviously be what were the methodologies you tried, what were what did you find successful, what did you have a problem with, uh, what would you want to do different next time, and, and that's for the process and for the product, what did you develop, how did it work, what the strengths and weaknesses. So the discussion would be strengths and weaknesses, and, uh, and uh, looking at um, why we came where we came, and what could the rationality be. And also some of the limitations. So, in the general case, and this could happen in your case, so in your case you have the document, the process, and the product. So they're kind of two parts. Process and product, 
one report. Now the question is, will you then first say this is our process? How do you do it? What is the experience and discussion? And then the product? How did you organize the product work? What were the results? And what is the discussion? That's one way. And uh, because, I mean, we have method results discussion, method results discussion in, in three different uh, sections. But, and this works very well if these three cases are very independent. There's little overlap because then when you discuss the discussion will be uh, for this case. And here the discussion will be for this case. But when a process and a product, in your case, are more tighter, then when you discuss here, you may well like to discuss the product as well. So you have references across the chapters, and, and those long jumps are not necessarily so good. So in that case, you may do this way. So you say, OK, now how did you organize this project? And we say, OK. How did we, what were our, uh, in, in your case, what were our project methods? How did we organize the project? And how did we work on the product? How was the product development going and organized? Then the results, what did we experience in terms of process? And what were the actual product results? And then discussion on both the product and on the project. Which one is correct? This one, process product. This one, process product, process product, process product. Varies. It depends on the specifics of the of the project. What I would say is that it's it. Sometimes it's hard to say before <laughs> until you've written it. And when you've written it, what what I would think is that in old times when you were programming. Uh, um, CPUs with, uh, with assembler code. Some, uh, we had some long jumps and short jumps. Uh, meaning uh, short jumps were what you could put in, in one byte. And sometimes you had to jump further away. So you need two bytes on the stack to jump. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it, they said it's here because we prefer long jumps in terms of references. So if you like to refer to something, you would like to refer to something that is very close by. You don't want to make long references because mo the, uh, when, the, when the reader is reading, he needs to have mental capacity to keep in memory what you're currently discussing, and, and uh, current memory is limited resource. So if you're in the middle of it, you jump far away, the user can't remember, so you need to, to go through the pages and go back to where you refer to, oh, okay, that was what we talked about, and then you need to go into the discussion again. So try to make short jumps, try to make it so that you have a tight, um, uh, what do you say, tight bounding between the sub-chapters of a chapter. So if, when you discuss the methods, you like to go a little bit freely be, be from the product to the process, and the same with the results of the discussion, then this is a better one. Now, if you, when you discuss the, uh, the results, you need to refer a lot back to the methodology, and you're never going to talk about the other case, then this one is preferable. So try to think about the references and think about how much do the reader need to keep in his head at the same time to, to understand and, and uh, uh, appreciate what you do. But the important is that it's clear what is the description of the methodology, what are your results and interpret it, but maybe filter and aggregate it, and what is your discussion. Clearly separated in different sections, chapters, subsections. It's very clear whether you talk about your understanding of data, or data, or how you got the data. Three different uh, parts. Then you come to the conclusion. And the conclusion should, as the abstract, should summarize your main findings. And of course, you need to refer back to the introduction because in the introduction, you say, okay, we're going to do this work to fill up this gap. And in the conclusion, you have to say, okay, now this is what we tend in, uh, tried to, but we didn't find answers to this and that, but we did answer some of the other parts. So we need to refer back to the claim and say to what degree they were fulfilled. Uh, and of course, 
the conclusion must be based on discussion. Discussion is based on the results. The results is based on your methodology. So it needs to be a clear and consistent chain of action. To get the uh, at the time where you complete the project, you are the expert and you are the best one to say what could be done next. So that's also valuable, that you reflect on, okay, if we were to continue, what would we have done? What could we accomplish? What do we see as the major work needed, major contributions needed? Because I think uh, in the uh, scientific methodology, uh, I think uh, is Kruger still uh, the one responsible for scientific methodology? Yep. Yeah. And he's probably, he used to say at least, that every time a scientific question is answered, at least two new questions pop up. Because it's not like we solve any problem finally. It's more like, okay, now we come closer to a solution, but there are two uh, other things we can think of. Either would this work in a different case, different setting? If we had changed something, would it have the same results? So there's always more to learn. So, uh, uh, and the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. But because of that, at the end of the project, it's always good to look back and say, okay, now, what or what all did? What can we do more? What? How could this be continued? And that's an important part of the uh, report as well. Of course, more on a scientific uh, a scientific report. But in your case, what what you could do here as a, uh, in in the further work part is to say, okay, now if you were to make this into an integration project, what would be an actual next step? If you were to to explore more new ideas. If you were to add some innovative features, what could those innovative features be? Because you've worked on this for quite long and you see, okay, now you know the basics, you get the basics there. But if you were to really uh, make a more of a leap in, in terms of functionality, in terms of, uh, of innovativeness, what could you then do? That could be one way to frame this in your case. And of course, if you were a methodologist that you would really love to try, that you didn't have time to, that's also something that you could put up here. But that would help you next time you do a project to experiment with some other methodology. References. Um, there are mostly students that are quite good in making a reference list, but there are still some uh, lack common lacks in the references. And one of them is references aren't always complete. A reference must answer who wrote this. And if there's no single uh, human author you can recognize, there's a company, there's someone behind. So if it's a, if it's a white paper, the white paper is written by a company, if, if not then as a person. You need to know who is responsible, who, who is uh, is uh, the owner and on many web pages you typically find at the bottom copyright somebody okay so that is, those are those are the authors or what you find on that page what that would be the title of the work where was it published and keep in mind that many of these pieces of work are published in many places so finding it in, on a web page is not the best references best reference to it because typically it may have been published in a journal or in a magazine or in a conference proceedings then it's better to have that exact reference to the proceedings to the journal to the paper to some persistent because what's what's good about the internet is that it's flexible but that's also the disadvantage because references may be gone and things in one place may have been changed. Do you like to have reference to some persistent place? When was it published? Or in the web, web page case, when did you last visit the page? Do you say, okay, that date it contained this thing? Do you need to have all this? Uh, and usually, usually you will get them. Uh, you should stick to one of the common styles. We, in this course, we are not requiring, and I don't think we ever really require that you strictly follow a style. 
But the good thing of following a, a, a certain style is that you're going to automatically remember all of this, and it's going to have a consistent look. So it's much easier for a reader, and especially if you publish this in a society where everybody is expecting a certain style, it's good to stick to that style. In, uh, in technical disciplines, and in LaTeX, if you use DeepTech, then the Vancouver style is common. And Vancouver style is where you, where you have this uh, C, uh, O, S, F, L, and then you have reference tree. That, that's kind of the, the, the style there. And the Harvard style is being used more in humanitarian and medical and other areas. You will have O, S, F, L, and then you will have in parentheses OS at L 2018. And, uh, and you may have an A if you had multiple publications at the end. They each of them have their own uh, advantage, disadvantage, but pick one of them and, and stick to it because then you have a consistent style and you will remember everything. If you use Word, then EndNote, if you use LaTeX, BibTeX, will help you manage all of this. And it will make it possible for you to create uh, libraries of, uh, of references that you can use later on as well, once you've found them. Because that's another thing here, is that when you find papers that you like, Try to write this all down immediately, because then you know it. It's so frustrating when you are to, to hand in your report, and you have these, uh, uh, these uh, pile of papers or number of PDFs, and you have the titles, and you find the authors, and now you need to figure out what was the full reference, when was it published, and where was it published, and you need to spend the last few minutes of writing a report and trying to find all these references. But you had them all read the first time. So make it in the habit, keep that BibTeX file updated. Whenever you find something, just add an entry to your BibTeX file or into your add notes. If you don't use it, it's just going to live in the file. It's not going to make any harm because you're not going to include it in the reference unless you refer to it. OK, so all together, this is going to be, uh, if you have a big, like your master thesis, it's going to be this. It has the separate page with the title and author. It will have a preface, table of contents, these are figures, these are tables, abstract, and then the introduction and background methodology results, discussion, conclusion, maybe some acknowledgments, maybe some references, maybe some appendices. Well, there will be references, otherwise, I don't think you're going to pass the master thesis. But this is typically uh, the bigger report. In, in, uh, in your report, you don't need to have the first part here with the table contents and the figures, you don't need appendices, but if you, if you want to, you can. But it's not strictly necessary because the, the project may not require all that. You may be able to just have a, a core part in your report. But this is kind of the extended uh, structure. Appendices might be a good way to include complete references. In your case, it may be that you have some, you like to show all the burnout charts, it may be that you like to show a summary of all the uh, stand-up meetings, whatever. You may have some data that you, some of it is extracted into the results, but you, for, for completeness, you have an appendix, an appendix where you can look at all the details. Uh, Again, it's not strictly necessary. It depends on, on uh, how much support you think you need for the discussion. Dictionaries, if you have lists of words that you've used, long proofs, code examples, not, I mean, we have Git for, uh, and you can have a Git reference for your repo, and you can find all the code details there. But it may be that uh, we discuss some in detail, some code in the report, and for convenience, you would like to have some of the surrounding code in the appendix, so that you can refer to it. But then the full code will be in uh, in Git. So, question is, 
how are you writing the report? We were saying that reading the report would uh, typically not be from the introduction and all the way through the end. But how would you write it? What is your style? Uh, you prefer writing into kind of starting from the beginning, ending up in the end, or you like to write a little bit here, a little bit there, and eventually you just tie it all up? Or what is your writing style? Start where it's easiest. Start where it's easiest. That's, a good, that's actually a very good choice, because it's usually quite hard to get started. So starting with the easier part is usually a good, uh, good uh, thing to do because then you start with something that you start producing and then you you get into the flow and you can continue with the harder parts. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good, uh, good suggestion. Any other? Yeah. I I think you and, and all these approaches is about trying to get an idea of everything before you start working on the details. And uh, and what I uh, what I suggest to some of the um, some of the students is that towards the end of a project, you have an idea of the conclusion. So if you think about this, so we have intro, you have methodology. You have results, you have discussion, you have conclusion. Now, when you start, when we are done with the final sprint and you start thinking about the report, you could probably already, as you said, you could probably already make, take, what, what are, what do you think will be the conclusions? You don't write conclusion chapter, but you start making some bullet points. Say, okay, these are my five conclusions, or three, or two, or one, or whatever. And then they say, okay, these conclusions need to be supported by discussion. So I need some bullet points related to one, I need some bullet points related to two, I need some bullet points for discussion that leads up to that conclusion. And then results, the discussion needs to be on, on, on some results. And how did I get these results? Well, I need this methodology, I need this methodology, I need this methodology. And you just make some, as you were saying, some, some bullet points. But maybe rather than starting from the intro, you start from the con uh, conclusion, because this is where you will end up. And then in the intro, you have kind of a, a general setting, motivation, why did we do this? So, because this one is kind of pointing over here, these are your claims, and they will point over here. So, maybe you start by, by saying, these are my claims, and these will be the conclusion. And then, we can write up this in any order we like. What field, I mean, you have kind of bullet points everywhere, so you can just fill in, as you say, pick the easy one, get them out of the way, and get into the flow and then towards the end and possibly as I said in the reverse order and in the end you write up the conclusion the final conclusion because now you haven't read you can write up the final conclusion and the abstract will be now trying to summarize the conclusion and then the title in um, in some of these, uh, not this course, but some of the courses, uh, next year, advanced project work and the master thesis, you are, are uh, if you're even required to, but at least uh, we, we need some initial titles. So sometimes the title, sometimes you make a preliminary title early on. But still, setting the final title should be the last thing you do, because this is a preliminary title, and as work goes, you change a little bit, and when you have written everything and you look at it, then you can say, okay, now what is the best title? 
describing this. So the title, the final version of the title, even if you have submitted titles, initial titles, preliminary titles for your projects early on, because we ask for it, say, okay, we would like to have a suggested title, that's just a suggested title. The final one is the last thing you make. That's my suggestion. Because it should, it should kind of be the best way of describing what is written, and that you know when you're done. A um, little bit about writing, the writing style and typography. Clear and concise, concise writing, trying to make so that one thought per paragraph and the flow from one paragraph to the other feels natural, so it's easy to read. Um, high information density. This is interesting because uh, if you were to optimize a report, sometimes we think that we would like to optimize the amount of information in a report. The more information, the better. That's half of the truth because to me, I think you need to divide by number of words because if you could have the same information on, uh, in half the size, half the number of pages, obviously the reader is going to be much more happy because he can do le in less work, he can get the same information. So try to make it dense and uh, concise. Now, the problem for you and for technical people is mostly that we, we have too little information. We take a lot for granted. We assume that the reader, obviously the reader just knows this or understands this. Uh, so typically we err on the side not having enough information. So then there is a little bit too few words as well. But, but try to pick high information density. All the information divided by number of words. So what's going to happen when you write this way is that you write, a, especially if you write a little bit here and there, you write something in the intro, you write something in the methodology, in the result, in the discussion, in the conclusion, and then you start saying, okay, well, this is really more or less a repetition of what I said here, and maybe here I also repeat myself. So try to, uh, in the final pass, try to uh, remove repetitive stuff, try to avoid very large, what's, what's the difference between very large, very large, extremely large? It's, it's not very well defined, so it's probably better off just saying large. Um, adjectives and adverbs, there are some purists who think that you could do without any of them, <laughs> but at least try to make sure that when you have those words that are, we add, do they really have meaning? Do they change? If I deleted the word, I have the same information. If you have them, you may choose to just delete it. Complete sentences. I mean, I, 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 I think every year we have uh, we have uh, reports where the uh, some paragraphs look like there's an SMS. You don't write complete sentences. Uh, and that is. Uh, we expect that in the kind of report. And, and why is this important? Well, it's important because it builds credibility. You write a scientific report, or in this case, a, a technical report, and you would like the reader to have trust in what you write. And if what you write is, is very sloppy, it's, it uh, seems like you don't um, really bother to explain everything in much in, in all details, then you may have the idea that uh, the reader may have the idea, okay, if they did, didn't really bother to explain it all, write it all in full sentences, maybe they didn't even do a good job. So, so it's about credibility and, 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 and creating trust, trustworthiness. Um, language. Spelling, grammar, we have tools these days, so there is, there is really no reason for having a lot of spelling and grammar errors. Of course, the language, especially English language, is subtle, so it may not find everything, but at least you could get rid of quite a few by using uh, some of the tools. 
And also try to avoid ambiguity, meaning that what you write can be interpreted many or two or more ways. This is a, a, a technical report. It's typically not a place where you have a lot of slang or humor or a colloquial style where you have this is what you would say when you meet somebody and just say directly, but this is a technical report. It's a bit more formal. So if you use humor, be careful. I don't say that you should never use it, but be very careful. And when you use it, it has for, to be for a very good reason, and you have to know what the potential um, disadvantages could be. Don't use too many abbreviations. And the ones you use, it's a good idea to have a list of abbreviations. Very sentence length and structure, meaning that a little bit of variety. I had once a student who wrote a master thesis that looked like a brick of text. Almost no paragraphs, just long text. And you know, when I talked to the external examiner, and I said, oh, you know, this is probably one of the hardest reports I've ever written. I fell asleep every two pages. <laughs> That's not a good starting point for a good, good, good grade. So a little bit of variation in, in, in the report will make it easier for the reader to keep awake. And that's number one. The reader should be awake. That's the way if the reader can't stay awake while reading, it's not going to be a good result. Um, on uh, Confluence, there's a link to the European Commission English style guide. Uh, it's long, so I don't expect you all to be experts on everything there, but go through it. And if you have questions, consult it there. How do you write dates? How do you write the abbreviations? Consult the English style guide. Because they try to, what they're trying to do here is to make sure that within the European community, the uh, there are different dialects and different languages and, and uh, English. They would like to have one common style. And that's a good style for us to advocate as well. So. Photography, um, make it easy to read. So if you, what, what I suggest is that you choose a document template that takes care of this already, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, but it, it, we know that it's much easier to, to read if the lines are too long, because if the lines are too long, the eye is going to use the time to find exactly the next starting point on the next line. Space will help, again, direct the eye, will make it more appealing. Uh, yeah, be consistent. Don't play around with, I, I think that time is over, but sometime, I mean, when you had color printers and you had many fonts, then uh, uh, trying to, to Combine too many styles is just confusing. If you if you want to if you want to use a style for breaking, then make sure that you, you know what the purpose is, and you make sure that there aren't too many other breaks that will just confuse. Titles in English are typically capitalized, and capitalization also in cross references. You have figure three, then capital F, in chapter six, capital C. It's common because it's kind of the the name of the book. And it stands out in text a little bit better. Yeah, so. it also stands out much better. Yeah. So it's not just a figure, but it is the figure three. Yeah. So, and, and of course, then in the caption, you will see a figure three with a capital F. So, so it, uh, it makes it easier to, 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 to visually com yeah. yeah, visually and to match it to the actual figure. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, finally, this report. And this is a report that is there to demonstrate that you have reflected on your learning. Is we, what we like to see is that you met the expected learning outcomes that you had or you got them, and, and that you can not just show what you did, but you could also reflect on it, showing that your reflection would show that you really mastered these skills and, and you have this knowledge. So, if you think about the purpose, demonstrate that you require the expected learning outcomes. That's the number one purpose. And audience, as we said before, examiners, future employers, maybe. Maybe this is a project that you are quite happy about and you would like to give future employers. This is something that we're not so good at in, uh, in our field, and that is to, to build up portfolios of projects and activities. I mean, you have the GitHubs, and, and right now, 
quite a few actually, if you were to apply for a job, quite a few will ask you for employers, potential employers would ask you for your Git account to see what you have done before. And But even building up a portfolio of projects, a project report, say, hey, this is who I am, this is, these are the projects I've been involved in, it's helpful. And then, if you think about that type of, type of, of reader, you, you may need to include something that can be appreciated. That will also be helpful to the examiners. There's nothing, I don't think these have totally different interests. They have mutual overlapping interests, but it may be that you add a little bit more or that, that may also be useful to examiner, even though the examiner don't really require it, need it. It will be helpful, can be helpful as well, because it shows a bit of your reflection and, and where you're heading. Now, if you look at the uh, learning outcomes for this course, what you're supposed to gain is a knowledge in tools and methodologies used to develop state-of-the-art computer applications. And you are supposed to acquire knowledge regarding the importance of different quality attributes, including security. So somehow, I suggest that your report is demonstrating that you have knowledge in the two methodologies and you know how to assess uh, quality attributes and security. So it would be good if the report somehow provides uh, results and you discuss and you conclude. So the, this will, the results will include some uh, results that will demonstrate quality, and you will discuss that, and you will conclude in a way that will say, okay, hey, you really have knowledge about the importance, and you have taken that into account. There is more on skills, so you are able, capable of using the art tools and methodologies, which means that obviously you need to document which tools and methodologies you used, how you used them, and reflect on strengths and weaknesses and conclude whether they were useful or not, why, why not. So that shows that you are capable of using that. And as uh, Dipti was saying in the first lecture, it's not like agile is one thing, it needs to be adapted to the project, adapted to the team, adapted to the, uh, what, the, what the, the product is all about. So that is what we need to see here, that you, you have chosen and you have adapted to that uh, specific to a specific project. People design and develop the software to meet a set of quality requirements, capable of planning and conducting systematic testing of software systems. So somehow, I mean, the planning and conducting systematic testing doesn't say that you need to have 80% unit testing or that you have to have manual testing and that you have integration or acceptance testing, doesn't say. But it says that you're capable of planning and conducting. So somehow you need to provide the results of how you plan and how you conduct it. And you need a discussion why you consider this to be systematic. <laughs> so, so this is kind of, um, what this should be about. And uh, can write technical report. Well, we will see that. You don't have to provide much uh, evidence because evidence will be in your report for that. So, so you don't have to have a, a chapter on, on uh, the, the, <laughs> the, how you approach the uh, report writing. I think that should be okay. And then general competence. That you should uh, gain experience in technical writing. Again, as you will see here, experience in working in groups. So the group aspect, reflect on the group aspect. How did you divide the work? How, what was the disadvantage of splitting the glide project in two very, uh, up to now, two very different subgroups? What is the strengths and weaknesses? So why did it work? Why did it not work? And what is the group aspect? Uh, an understanding of professional practice in the field. So, so that is more the overall elaboration on the tools and methodologies. We'll complete it to this. Then we have this, uh, the one team knows this very well, reflection. So you, have, you, you do something, that's what you do now every week, every sprint, you do work that is supposed to lead up to these learning outcomes. And then you need, as I said, you need to document what happened, 
and what did you see? What did you experience? What uh, the burn out charts were off, estimates were off, uh, client and the server doesn't talk together. These are the things you need to document. Uh, so what does this imply? We are overlooking something in the estimate. We, uh, what is the consequence of having two teams that don't work together? What are the risks? What are the problems? And what do we do next? Okay, we, as we were saying, next time the client side and the server side need to work more together. And after the project, we will like here, in conclusion to see what would you do differently in your next group pro development project? Would you say, I would not go for Agile? Well, okay, that's fine if you would say so. Or, or would you say, what do you say about the methodologies, the way you organize the work, the responsibilities, the roles, the use of tools, which were good, which were not so good, what should be... Because, I mean, for instance, there uh, we go through user Jira and Confluence, and what we see in, later on in, uh, in the project, students may decide to use Trello or use some other wiki tools rather than Jira and Confluence. That's fine, because it means that you have some experience here, and based on that experience, you choose different tools, or maybe the same tools of a reason, not just because they are there, but of a reason. So this is kind of the reflection circle, and uh, as I was uh, hinting in the retrospective today, it, it is, this is the basis, so if you don't put down notes on this, if you don't have any recording on this, it's going to be hard, because this is kind of the step at the end of this course. So at least for the, uh, hopefully you guys already, since this is your, the, the topic of your project, you do write down notes and have a detailed description of what happened here in the retrospective, and you do um, look at uh, between, the, uh, between the, uh, the sprints and also towards the end, you do look at based on all the all things we did. What can we learn about? What, are the, what did it mean to us? What did it mean to our productivity? That, what did it mean to our quality? What did it mean to, uh, to how skilled we became? And that, we say, okay, now what should we do next? What's the next project? What do I do? The content, as I said, you need to find a good structure, but you need to describe uh, both the product and the process. Because the, uh, what did I say, the proof, the English would say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> so, I mean, reading a recipe would give an idea about the pudding. But only by eating it, you know if it's good. The same here, would the methodologies be good if they develop crap software? No. So we need to see the software as well. What happened? What did you produce using this methodology? So code, design patterns, quality parameters, segmentation, test strategy, so that you here have the basis for a discussion. And then in the process, how did it, uh, how the planning part of it, your retrospectives, and your roles. Assignment of roles, the way you plan, the way you, the retrospectives, among other things. So that, that will be relevant. But at least this should be part of it. And then, of course, what tools are used for, and your experience with version control and branch, branching, and Jira, and burned out charts, or whatever chart you had. What is your experience? What, what worked, what didn't work, and, and what do you do differently next time? And the quality of the rooms. How did you do quality review testing documentation in a systematic way? And, uh, and we know, we all know, that there is an ideal world and there's a real world. And in the ideal world, everything will be perfect. So you had time to test everything, uh, I mean, you had time to test every configuration of your tool. You had time for everyone to be the, uh, the Scrum Master, you had, time, you had time to test both with and without a Build Master, uh, and you had time to develop the software as you wanted to, and you had time to do all the code reviews, and all the testing, and all the documentation. So in an ideal world, 
we did everything perfectly. Now, we all live in the real world, and in the real world, There, are, there aren't many companies that would say they do code review as good as they should, or the testing as good as they should, or the documentation, or that they have uh, developed as much functionality as they would like to. So it's hard. It's hard to be perfect on all this. So what we ask for here is not that you try to say, okay, we did all this perfectly, is that you have learn from it and you can see what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the, what are the disadvantages of not doing more systematically. What did you do? And you say, okay, now we didn't do this and that testing for these reasons. And if these reasons are good, then we can live with that. And then you say that, okay, but if I have a project like this and that, we will do more of this and that testing. So it, it's not so much about everything you did in all details, but it's also about how you reflect on what you did, what were your choices, why did you decide to, and what are the consequences? And why would this be okay here or was not okay here? And when could it be okay or not okay? So that's the kind of uh, what we're aiming at because we know that it's not, it's not gonna be perfect, but it needs to be so that you have a better understanding of how to do this and how to adapt in a professional setting. Your approach and your security group. And sort of security, as I said, part of the group and part of the policy. Yes. Conclusion on this presentation. So, different types of reports have different structure, content, but I think what I did in the beginning is to say what, what are the generic expectations, what are the generic considerations because most of this would be in any report when it comes to the overall structure, when it comes to the, the typography and to the writing style and, uh, and user figures, whatever we're talking about, so in general. But, um, but you have to specifically think about the audience and the purpose of the individual report. And as I said, for the coming report, the audience it would be the examiners plus possibly Prospective employers and, and other project teams that would like to continue working on it, and uh, and the purpose is to demonstrate that you have uh, achieved the learning outcome. Writing is a skill, which means that the only way to learn to write is to write a lot. So you have to practice. You should seek feedback from supervisors, but the ten, I tend to see the, that you're so busy writing a report in the end that you never had time to give the supervisor earlier drafts. I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to try to give the supervisor some drafts, but I see that uh, they don't always. We are trying to. Uh, give you some uh, give you some feedback. Uh, besides whether you pass or fail on your individual reports. So after you submit your initial reports and you have the examination, I will try to write up, uh, deep denial, write up a short uh, qualitative feedback on what was good, what was not so good in the report. Not in your work in overall because you have pass or fail, but on your report so that the next time you write a report you can hopefully write a little bit better report. That's um, the objective. And that is just to get started. Writing early and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Any questions about report writing in general or the, the, uh, this report? Yes? Yeah, in general, uh, hyperlinks in uh, text. How do you deal with that? Uh, uh, hyperlinks in text. Um, I, th I think it, it varies a little bit where in uh, and what is the purpose. Um, I I think it's okay for uh, in running text if you like to refer to an uh, to an API or to a toolkit or to some methodology. I, I'm just putting the hyperlink in parentheses in the text. If it is for some work that you refer to, then it's better to have it in the reference list. In the reference list, you have everything, and then you include the hyperlink there. 
but uh, to me it's fine. I don't know what uh, Mario thinks about it, but to me it's uh, fine to have hyperlinks for, for uh, let's say, if you come across the uh, latest version of Angular or something like that, yeah. just putting in the running text. Yeah, sometimes I use the uh, footnote because it sort of makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. At the bottom. That also works. Yeah. Whatever you feel would be easier for the reader to grasp. But it, what's important is that hyperlinks related to references should be in the reference box. So then you have a rather reference and then find yeah. the text. Yeah, one, one additional comment is that sometimes you refer to a particular version of the page. So, for example, if you're referring to Angular and you want to put Angular URL, that, that's fine. But sometimes you're referring to a page um, describing something. And you may not know, like for the report, it doesn't matter that much. But for the thesis, for example, somebody may read it in two years' time and that page might not be there or that page might have changed. So it's like we kind of advise people to use the web archive and link to the web archive page instead of the original page uh, because then you are guaranteeing that whoever will be looking at the page will see exactly what you saw on that date. Sometimes people say uh, checked at particular date and then they allow that it may change. So it sort of depends on the nature of the reference that you're making with the URL. Uh, if you really need kind of a consistent text that was there, then use the web archive and link to that one. If you don't care, then you can just use the plain URL. Uh, yeah. But it is definitely a good idea to include the date. That's was, right, yeah, when it was last accessed, uh, from when you you are using it. Um, yeah. Other questions? I'm still here. If you have time, give supervisors a chance to, to give them and give you some feedback. No. Yep. Perfect. And I'll ask Dipti about the Thursday. 